Great, thank you, Annie. Thank you. Um, and our guest tonight is uh, Linda Chalker Scott, who is associate professor at uh, Washington State University and uh, a prolific blogger, and she has who has a reputation as a real mythbuster. Uh, she is taking horticulture and landscape practice back to the basic science, uh, the evidence for the good practice. Uh, and because of her fantastic track record in this respect and, and publishing, um, we've actually commissioned her to do a series of eight webinars for us starting in the second week of October, which is really uh, called Plant It, which we've dubbed Plant It Right, which is going through that basic science about soil preparation, about planting, uh, staking is it a good idea is it not a good idea mulches all of these practices which however wonderful your designs are uh, planting needs to be done right soil preparation and 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 aftercare uh, and there is so much um, uh, not necessarily mythology but different ideas about what should be done it's it's great to get back to that that solid evidence base which Melinda will be running through uh with with that uh, webinar series so that could i think be potentially very very useful for, for for a great many of us um so perhaps first of all linda perhaps would, would you just like to introduce yourself and say kind of how you got to be where you are sure and you'll have to cut me off if i go too long because it's been a long, a long and winding road getting to where I am now. Um, so I started my my career in you know in plant sciences, getting my PhD in, in woody plant physiology, and I was really focusing on cold hardiness. And then that kind of morphed into looking at all different types of environmental stresses. And at that point, I was really more of a bench scientist, and so I was looking at um, you know physiological processes, um, <clears throat> structural um, differences. Uh, in morphology, just in terms of how plants would survive stresses. And that went on for a number of years. And then in 2001, our um, horticulture facility was firebombed by eco terrorists and we lost everything. So, yes, and you didn't know this, did you know? I always have some. No, no. <laughs> and there's me always making jokes about the organic Taliban or organic jihad. <laughs> oh, that was exactly what it was. And they were even so misinformed as to think that, that there was GMO work going on at the center, which there was not. There was um, poplar breeding, but it was the good old fashioned way with doing you know, hybrid crosses. But anyway, so I had to wait for a number of years to have the facility built back. And at that time had no lab or any way of really continuing my lab work. So I started focusing on landscape issues because I was teaching a landscape plant management course anyway. And so I started just getting outside and looking at things and in our lovely Seattle climate where, you know, we have, you know, fairly, fairly moderate weather and enough rainfall, just an awful lot of plants dying. And so I was taking my physiology background and kind of trying to and do a little bit of horticultural CSI to figure out why things were dying. And so that got me into a lot of the, th the poor planning practices that have been going on <clears throat> less than a century, really. It's, it's been with the advent of all these you know, improvements like, like containerized plants and ball and burlap as opposed to planting bare root trees. And we'll get into that later. But I started looking at the practices. I started looking at the products that were being promoted for, for trees. And this is where, you know, my, my, my pretty broad background um, got me into the, well, how, how, how would this possibly work? So I would look for, you know, the references, because I assume that all these products have some sort of um, science behind them. And to my, <laughs> to my surprise, most of them don't. And there is no regulation um, at, in the States for garden products. Um, the FDA, of course, regulates food and drugs. There is nothing for garden products. And as long as it isn't um, a health hazard or an ecological uh, environmental hazard, which is regulated by the EPA, it doesn't matter if they work or not. So it really is a free for all. And uh, one of my um, colleagues likes to joke that uh, once the FDA was invented, all of the snake oil salesmen moved into garden products. And so that's pretty much what I found. And then in conjunction with this, when I was teaching my class, um, and I found there really, really weren't any good resources on, on scientific basis of, of managing gardens and landscapes. You know, there are spotty things here and there. 
but there just wasn't a, a good body of, of, of literature to, to draw on. So I started kind of just doing this on my own with specific things that would be bugging me <laughs> a particular month and, and you know, would write a, a myth column um, for our, our state nursery association just on things that bugged me and why. And that's kind of how I got started. So you, you mentioned uh, one possible reason for the amount of so they say snake oil salesmen and other mountie banks in selling garden products that you know FDA uh, with food and drugs you 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 uh, you have to actually be able to support your your, your claims and presumably with a lot of complementary medicine as, as well but uh, are there any other reasons why you think there are so many myths uh, in 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 horticulture I think the main reason really is the lack of science I mean we can kind of compare this, I mean, you know, this isn't, the science doesn't exist, but the research isn't out there. So we can kind of look at medicine a few centuries ago when there was all kinds of, of, of potions and practices that we now know were bogus. And that's because there was a lot of interest in, in researching this and there was a lot of money behind doing the research. Unfortunately for those of us that are passionate about gardens, there just isn't a lot of funding research, you know, fundable research to do. Um, in, in the States, it's usually through the U.S. Department of Ag, and they're more um, focused on food and fiber and diseases and introduced pests and things like that, which, of course, have some, you know, interaction with, with gardening. But the things that gardeners want to know about, you know, how, how to do something or if this product works or, uh, you know, how, how to figure out the type of soil you have, this type of thing just isn't, it, it's not fundable. So there are people that, that do research and publish it, but it's very slow to come out. And so we have a really small body of literature to draw from. In the meantime, of course, you know, people have been planting gardens and landscapes for centuries. And there was a lot of things that people would do. And then through anecdotal observations, think, oh, well, this is great. We'll continue to do this. And a lot of the so-called best practices that um, are in you know, landscape management and arboriculture right now are really not based on any type of science. And, you know, it's not that you have to have experimental research on every single little thing to, to call something a best practice, but it has to at least comport with known plant and soil science. And so if, you, if, you, if you're doing something that just doesn't make sense uh, with what we know about basic plant and soil science, then you really have to prove it with an experiment to, to show that it actually does work. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how myths start. I mean, I've been in this business kind of 30 years plus professionally. And during that time, you know, I've certainly seen myths arise. And I think we'll probably talk about some of those. I mean, the one I'm sort of dealing with a lot at the moment is because it comes up in uh, student assignments on uh, our Royal Horticultural Society Certificate Level, level 2. Uh, it's this idea that growing plants from seed uh, will result in uh, there, there be more disease resistant, more able to cope with adverse conditions, which is you can kind of see where it comes from, which is a sort of a, 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 a an understanding that if you have a genetically varied population, a certain proportion of those will be able to cope with, with a, a new disease that comes along or more severe drought or cold or whatever. Um, but um, actually applying that to sort of one, the contents of one packet of seed is, is, is not really a, a, a starter. And to actually try and explain all that to people involves you know, quite a, quite a decent length paragraph. Um, but it, it, it just it comes up again and again. And you say, well, where, where do these things, where do they start? Well, in terms of the one that you mentioned, I can't be 100% sure. Um, as you say, you can kind of see that it would quote, make sense because of the genetic variability. But I think a lot of it also might be because, you know, we, we've all planted things from seed. We've all planted things with containers and other types of, um, nursery, you know, preparation, maybe ball and burlap or whatever. And research has actually shown that things that are planted bare root, you know, so you get bare root stock, do better than the things that are in containers. And so I think a lot of it might be that, you know, people will plant a container plant, they don't prepare the roots properly, they don't remove all that media, and then things, things die because of, of, you know, what happens with uh, root, root science and with, with soil science. So they correlate their death, you know, the increased death when they're using these containerized plants and, and saying, you know, if I grow up with seed, it does just fine. And that's because the seed is actually establishing its roots in real soil. So I think that part of it is, is, is that 
we're, we're all we're all susceptible to, to, to conflating correlation to causation. You see two things happening, and you and you're convinced that one is causing the other. And so in this case, I would I would bet that at least some people think that it's um, you know the that the nursery plants just aren't genetically diverse enough, or they're not bred properly, or whatever. When actually it probably comes you know, just down to very poor planting practices. Mm -hmm. So I think this is you know that kind of touches on the nub of how I think most of these things get started. People see two things. Um, that change in tandem with each other, either positively, so you increase, you know, something like you increase water and you get more plant growth, or it decreases, you know, increase planting density and you get less soil water. So they they take that correlation, and those two and those two things actually are causative. But there's other things that people see that that are increasing or decreasing at the same time, or inverse, or whatever, and they're convinced that one is causing the other. And that's the problem. And that's why I've really been focusing the last several years on scientific literacy, you know, so people can understand uh, correlation and causation so they can ask the appropriate questions um, objectively to figure out if they're really, is, there, is this really a good, a good thing to do. Mm. Uh, another myth, which I've seen kind of come almost full cycle in my professional lifetime is, is, is mulch, uh, which I think is kind of sad in a way, because I remember oh gosh, back in the kind of 1980s, probably reading about this idea that, you know, we should be imitating nature and have this layer of decaying vegetable matter at soil, the soil surface. It reduces water loss. It reduces the growth of weed seedlings. And it's still imitating nature. It's good for biodiversity. And mulch was a really good thing. And mulch was being promoted by people who are sort of in a way a bit fringe. And I think this is one of the interesting things in horticulture is that you know, there's always people on, on the fringes uh, who are kind of feeding in ideas, some of which are completely balmy and others of which are actually really quite good. Um, and just sort of random selection of both get, get taken up. Um, and then we kind of come full cycle and sort of talking to somebody well, like Roy Diblick in the Midwest, who won't you mention mulch to him? And he starts to kind of froth at the mouth um, <laughs> because mulch escaping, you know, you talk about mulch scapes in the United States with uh, all that pine bark that's shipped up from the South. Um, and, uh, sorry, Wendy, um, and flogged to people in Chicago. Um, what went wrong with mulch? I mean, uh, uh, which I think is, a, in, in, in how can, how, but more importantly, how can we, um, how can we rediscover mulch, the, the real values of, 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 of using mulch properly? Well, you came with the right person. My daughter years ago gave me the, the moniker, the mulch queen. So I am, I am all about mulch. Um, and I've done a lot of research on mulch and a lot of publishing. So it's, it's, it's fortunately something that has a lot of good science behind it, but you're right. We've gone off the rails on it to some extent, and mostly it's because of really poor mulch choices. So the whole thing with bark, which, you know, here we call beauty bark, <laughs> which I think is hilarious, um, is it's really just a byproduct of the timber industry. You know, so the timber industry would, would shave all the, all, the, all the logs before they went to the mill and they just have these, these huge mounds of bark left over. And, you know, it's always good to try to find out other uses for those things rather than just burn them or throw them away. And so it became a gardener product. And everybody bought bags and bags of this, of this chipped up uh, bark mulch. And it turns out that bark mulch is not a good source of mulch because um, bark has a function on the tree and its function is to keep water in and other things out. So when you make a mulch that's, that's out of a hydrophobic material, that's relatively slow to break down, it's really not very good for either water or gas movement between you know, the upper atmosphere and, and the soil. So you have bad mulch choices. And uh, sawdust is another one. You know, people like sawdust because it's very finely textured, it looks uniform. So there's all these really bad mulches out there and the majority of them are not great. Um, I actually did a, <laughs> if anybody wants, wants to contact me later, I can send a copy of the, um, the the review I did, the literature review I did on this. And it turns out that the, really the very best mulches um, are, uh, are what we call arborist chip mulches. And so this is when you have the, the tree service come out, um, you know, and they're chipping up um, branches or whatever, along with the leaves and everything else. And you have this, you know, rather what some people consider to be messy looking um, uh, chipped up material, which is absolutely the best mulch you can use if you are growing the majority of, of woody plants and even many plants that aren't woody. And so 
Yes, in the Midwest, which is a grassland mostly, um, you don't really have native things. They're used to woody mulches. You know, the grasslands they have no, you know, it's 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 all um, just dead leaves for the most part. There's not a lot of woody material there. But if you're growing trees and shrubs and things with woody roots, they really do require a decent woody mulch because the mycorrhizal um, connections that are made there with beneficial fungi, they, those fungi also require that woody debris. So yes, you're absolutely right. You know, you go and look at what happens naturally, and you try to mimic that. So if you go into a forest, an actual forest, not, you know, urban trees in a, in a, in a, in a Southwest desert city, um, you know, you find that spongy layer and yeah, Ruth Stout, I think was probably, probably hit the nail on the head. And she wrote a book many years ago, I think it was in the fifties, um, you know, the no-till gardening book and without going into any of the problems there may have been with summer methods, she recognized the value of mulch and she was spot on. So yes, correlation conflated to causation. Sometimes you're going to hit it right. She hit it right without the research being there. But now we've got the research and we know definitively that most plants that we have in our landscapes and many of our garden bedding plants do better with a mulch than with not. And it has to be a well-chosen mulch. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's the trick is to choose, choose the mulch properly. And then when you see things going wrong, don't automatically blame it on the mulch if it is a good mulch. And this is what I see a lot that bugs me is that you'll see what we call mulch volcanoes. You know, so they're the big mounds that go around the trees and then trees will start to die. Well, it's not the mulch that's killing them. It's because they were planted poorly. And lots of times it's because the root ball wasn't, wasn't teased apart. They are planted above grade and they just throw the mulch on top to hide all these bad planting practices. And then when the tree dies, the mulch gets blamed. So yes, there's, there's a lot of misconceptions about mulch. Um, and it, yeah, it's been one of my missions to, to, to encourage people to, to use uh, wood chip mulches um, often and deeply. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so obviously here is a good example of how commercial pressures uh, certainly do play a, a, a role. Um, and and that they, that, 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 as we know, business can be can be very, very, very cynical. Um, I mean, fashion plays a part too. I and mean, I was just thinking of this, I, I don't think it's anything like the same in the States, but it's extraordinary fashion for growing vegetables in raised beds in, in Britain. And you hear people say things like, well, I want to grow vegetables, so I'm going to make myself some raised beds, as if you know, you have to have raised beds in order to grow vegetables, uh, which, you know, a previous generation would have thought utterly absurd. Um, I mean, if you've got a bad back or you're disabled or you haven't got any soil, raised beds are great. In most other situations, uh, they strike me as, as, as providing barracks for armies of slugs, uh, plants, right? There's, there's so many re reasons against them, but, but, but for some, that so many... Uh, it really has become a, 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 a fashion item. Uh, and you almost wonder whether actually being able to be seen to have raised beds is making some sort of, you're making some sort of statement to your neighbors. I, I don't know, uh, I have not traveled as much in the States over the last few years as, as I have in the past, but uh, are raised beds popular or people avoiding them? Um, they're really popular um, in urban areas. And so this touches on some legitimate reasons to do it. As you mentioned, um, yeah. if you're disabled, they have a bad back. Um, you know, a lot of our gardeners are getting up there in age, um, being one of them. And it's a lot easier that, you know, to, to be able to sit on the edge of a raised bed than crawl around on your hands and knees. Um, I do both, but I will admit that we have two raised beds um, for growing vegetables. And the main reason for us is to keep out the nibblers. So we have raised beds and then along the sides, we've got, we've got deer fencing. So we can't keep out the slugs and we can't keep out the birds, but we don't get the deer, we don't get the rabbits. And so that's a, one good reason to do it is to keep more of your, your produce for yourself. Um, another good reason um, that people do it, especially around where I live, is that we have a lot of um, industrial uh, contamination from you know, decades of, of really harmful practices. We had an aluminum smelter in my hometown of Tacoma, which belched out um, smoke that contained arsenic and all cadmium and all types of really toxic metals. And that of course was deposited, you know, downwind and you cannot grow vegetables there safely because depending on what you're growing, they, they can take up 
you know, a lot of these heavy metals. And so I always encourage people that before they even put in a, a vegetable garden at all is that they have a soil test done to make sure that they don't have residual lead from paint or residual lead from gasoline or, you know, some other type of, of heavy metal that can, that can pose a, um, a human health hazard. So there's some safety reasons. And then the last, the last reason that, that a lot of people end up having to do this is because they're their their soils are so poor because of the way that we have tended to do things when we develop land we come in we scrape off all the topsoil um it's not kept there for the homeowner it's taken away and sold to a soil company who then uses it to make these what my colleagues call a, a commercial fill it's not soil it's just junk it's topsoil mixed with compost mixed with sand mixed with whatever it's not a real soil so then you have this, this um subsoil and so then after the, the development is done, you know, the contractor comes back in usually with these mixed commercial fills that used to be real topsoil. And they put that on top and heavily amend it with compost, plant into it and th things don't do well. There's, there's just all these issues that have to do really with, with soil physics and, and um, movement of water and oxygen that just explain exactly why this doesn't work. So people get frustrated, they can't grow vegetables well. And so at least in a raised bed, they can have a uniform soil mixture that they can use. And so those are the, I think the legitimate reasons, but I agree with you. I mean, I see all these photo spreads of all these very, you know, very um, uh, precious containers with, with their vegetables all artistically arranged in, in such densities that you would never get anything from them. You know, they've all they've just you know, done a photo shoot with them. So those, those are, are truly annoying, but there are some good reasons to use these raised beds. And there's also a sustainability angle. I mean, there's one nightmare client, ex client of mine I can think of who shipped in, I mean, a whole virtual forest of oak, you know, great big oak sleepers to, to make her raised beds. And, and uh, you know, the higher income bracket people are in, the more they more likely they are to do this or to build them out of brick or whatever. And, and uh, um, I agree. I mean, that's, that, that, that's excessive. And, and since I live on a landscape, it has centuries old white oaks. I yeah. just think it's a real travesty to do yes, things like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, people, one of the problems with science is that people expect science to deliver certainty, but of course, it very rarely does. And the, there are often situations uh, where the, there are several, and this is one of the interesting things about horticulture, there are several different ways of doing something, and, and proponents of one of each can usually come up with some evidence for their approach to, to back them up. Um, I mean, do you have any, any advice for people on how they should go about making it, their own evaluations of conflicting evidence? Um, yeah, I mean, you can do this either, you know, on, on, on the ground. You can always, you can always be um, a citizen scientist on your own land. And there are some good publications um, out there on how to, how to conduct scientific experiments on your own land or in your greenhouse. So that's one way just kind of for fun to, to see if something works for you because even if something isn't demonstrated scientifically, there are gonna be things that people swear by and, and that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm not the garden police. I'm not gonna tell people they can't, they can't do things they want to do. Um, so there's always, there's always that way of doing your own trials to figure out what works. And you, you, actually there's a lot of citizen scientists that end up getting some really great results. And the second way is by just kind of developing your skills to do what I've called crap analysis. And what crap analysis is, is looking at the source, which is usually, um, it might be a web page, it might be an article, and it, you look for the author's credibility, um, the relevance of the information that you're reading to your situation, which in this case is gardening. And a lot of people erroneously will take um, information that's from growing crops in an intensive situation. So a monoculture, intensively produced is not the same thing as, as a vegetable garden and certainly not the same thing as a landscape. Um, the third thing is accuracy. So how recent is the material? It doesn't, it doesn't mean that all the material is wrong, but you should always try to find out if there's something more recent. And with our field, it's, it's developing really rapidly, which is fun. There's always new stuff coming out. And then the third thing is more just kind of a, a reality check. You know, what's the purpose? Why is this person promoting this? Is it because they're really you know, they really are interested in, in educating you and sharing good science, which hopefully is, you know, what you and I do, or is it, you know, trying to make a buck? And there's unfortunately a lot of things out there where you're trying to make a buck. 
And once you learn how to do this, it really is fun. And I find myself doing this with all kinds of things now. But to take it back to your original question about, you know, people get frustrated because science isn't definitive. Um, it's not. It, it's always changing. And it, which is good. It's dynamic. It shifts as evidence shifts. And we can see exactly the same thing happening with what's happening with COVID and with the vaccines and with information coming out, new information <clears throat> from all this research. And so the messaging is changing. And you know the doctors and the CDC and, and public health people can't help that. But what's missing is the explanation that science advances. This is a, a novel virus. We're learning more about it every day. And yes, we're gonna be changing our recommendations as we get more information. That's just how science works. Mm -hmm. And I think that as, as a whole, we as, a, as, as people have just become more impatient. We want things immediately. We want our information 100% accurate. We want everything now. And we're not willing to accept the fact that things are not set in stone and are going to change. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it does come back to that fundamental misconception about how about how science works mm -hmm. uh, and the number of people uh, at schools are just not particularly good at getting this across but but you know science works very often in a way that is is often quite slow and method meth, meth, um, methodical and is a certain amount of three steps forward two, two steps back um now you're obviously very concerned with, with good practice in the garden and landscape industry and you do a fantastic job of disseminating information um are there any other particular examples from perhaps from, from the united states north america you would mention of really good examples of dissemination of good evidence-based practice that could be uh, the rest of us could, could learn from? Um, you know, the, the industry that I've worked with that I've found to be most responsive to the science end of things is been the, the tree care, the arboriculture industry. And I think the reason that they are is they're not the ones that are choosing the plants. They're not the ones that are installing them. They're not managing. They're coming in when things are going wrong. And so they're seeing all the bad practices and they're finding out what's, you know, and what's, what's good and what's bad for trees. And because they're seeing this evidence in their day-to-day -day practice, I think they're much more open to understand the science behind it. I think a lot of times um, people in, you know, in whatever industry they're in either don't care about the science or just aren't exposed to it or don't see the relevance. And so when you're talking about urban planners, you know, they're not thinking about tree health. When you think about many landscape designers and landscape architects, not all, but many, they're just looking at, at, at plants as design elements. They're not being looked at as things that are dynamic and they're changing size and in their demands. Um, and you look at the, the, the people that are managing a landscape commercially, um, installing them, they're just trying to get things done as quickly as possible. So they don't really care that much about the plant science either. And it's not that you know what individuals might care, but in terms of being a successful business and making money, the way to do that is to do things, as we said, quickly um, and have a very short window of um, warranty time before things fail. And then the people at the end, they're coming in and taking care of hazard trees or diagnosing why trees are dying. That's the industry that's been really responsive. Mm. So. I think the other thing to do, as you and I tend to do, is, is really hitting people one on one. I mean, you and I met, you know, in, in uh, Vancouver, BC, when we were both speaking to the Master Gardeners, and Master Gardeners are really that conduit. I mean, they were in, they were actually invented in my institution, and the reason that they were invented as a group was because people like you and me were getting inundated with questions from home gardeners, and we really just needed kind of a, a, a para educational group to come in and, and help give advice. So when you can have those one-on-one -on -one contacts, um, you really can start to change minds. I, I remember speaking to um, a woman who owned a landscaping company actually in, in uh, British Columbia as well. And one of her clients, her best client had seen a, a seminar I'd given on, on root washing, you know, taking all the stuff off the roots, getting the roots into native soil. And she told this business owner that she wanted all of her trees from that point on installed bare root. Well, uh, I found out that I was a very disliked person um, by that particular business owner for quite a while until she discovered that she had no failures. She had no replacements and she actually saved money because she didn't have to come back and replace them about 10% every year. So she ended up doing it for all of her plants, for all of her clients and was a much happier and 
uh, better off business person for it. So it's just having that that personal interaction, you know, me speaking to a homeowner who spoke to a professional saying, you know, this is what I found out. And for that professional not to be shy and, and you know, really contacting me and finding out details. So other than that, in terms of, in terms of reaching people, I think things like you're doing, you were the garden masterclass. I think that um, educational uh, media groups um, like the great courses, Things that really focus on, you know, the 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 best information from people that are truly experts um, are probably the best way to reach people in absence of having a one on one. Mm -hmm. um, now, in your um, on your your website, which lists a very impressive uh, array of um, uh, short articles on a, on a very wide range of, uh, of topics. You have a, a myth buster on biodynamic methods, which uh, let's face it, is, is not difficult and a pretty easy target. Uh, but what about the wider organic movement, uh, which um, to be fair, I mean, uh, that what, some of what the organic movement have been promoting for, for years is now being taken very much more seriously by um, mainstream uh, agriculture, main, mainstream practice. Um, but the organic movement, needless to say, has generated its own share of, of, of mythologies. I mean, what's your current take you know, on the movement as a, as a whole? Um, it's, it's kind of a mishmash. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason is, I think that like a lot of other bodies of practice like biodynamics it tends to be a lot of philosophy as opposed to being science-based and that's i'm not saying the philosophy is bad but the philosophy is we want to go back to nature and do things um the way that is supported by nature and we don't want to use you know these newer technological you know developments and a lot of those are, are completely accurate I mean, we know because of research and you know, how important it is to use mulch and mulches were, were, you know, were not used before, even though they're natural. So there's, there's many things that do fit into the, um, can be demonstrated by science to be effective um, model, but there's other things that don't. And I think that actually permaculture as a movement, which is very popular here in the States, um, which embodies, you know, organic practices, plus a lot of other stuff, which is, I don't know where it comes from. It, it certainly doesn't come from science, but things like um, uh, planting nitrogen fixing trees in the same root zone as um, your other plants to, to give them nitrogen. You know, it's, it, this stuff, it doesn't work. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a misperception that this is going to actually have some effect. So what I really, I really wish is that a lot of these movements um, that, that blend both philosophy and, and you know, some good scientific practices would, would start to kind of clean house and kind of pay, peel off the things that really aren't beneficial, explaining why, you know, and it's easy enough to say, you know, we know more now through science than we did before. We know that these things really aren't appropriate for these reasons that we're gonna focus on, um, you know, the good organic practices. And I use a lot of organic practices myself because there are a lot of good ones. Um, in fact, uh, you know, the, the whole thing with wood chip mulches, which I've said have been a convert to for, for a long time, was really um, poo pooed by a lot of people in, in science because they had these misperceptions about what the wood would do to the soil, which were, were all erroneous. But yeah, so I, I, mean, I feel for people that, that, um, that are part of, you know, that want to do things organically because a lot of people do kind of look down their nose at it. But there are some good practices. And I think that as educators, what we have to do is peel off the good ones and promote those mm -hmm. things like polyculture. Um, yeah. You know, all these things that, that you're familiar with that, that do fit into the, the model of organic practices. And the cool thing is, as you know, is that aesthetically, it's so much more interesting that to do yeah. a lot of these good organic practices. Um, yes, but it is, it, well, I know we're talking about horticulture not agriculture but uh, you know if you're running a farm um polyculture is not exactly uh, very cost effective <laughs> no, yeah. it's not yeah. but it works well, but it works well in terms of uh reducing um disease and pest pressure mm -hmm. and so that's that's why i think it's really a, a good idea for for gardeners who yes. aren't necessarily yes. looking to have to have a you know big bang for their buck mm -hmm. 
yeah, polyculture, by the way, is just the opposite of monoculture. It's, it's growing several crops to, together in close uh, proximity, which, of course, is what gardeners tend to do anyway. But, right. uh, yeah. Um, now, you obviously are in the special position that you have access to all these research papers, a lot of which you can only access uh, through uh, university academic institution subscriptions. Um, and I've always felt that there's all this you know, really interesting stuff out there in academia. I don't know whether you, in the States, you use this expression, the ivory tower, uh, but all that stuff in the ivory tower, and those, the rest of us, the 99, well, 98% of the population who aren't in the ivory tower, you know, don't have access to that. And, you know, what you're doing is, is you're sort of sifting and funneling and, and making it accessible to the rest of us. Um, and, you know, we, I mean, that, in a way, this is what, what a good writer science-based writer can do is you know they can try and access the material and, and, and disseminate it better but in terms of what you look at in terms of the scientific literature you know what are are there any particularly good sources or particularly good institutions or particular researchers who who you've learned a lot from or i think are particularly valuable um well i noticed that wendy just had a question about extension services and so that seems like a perfect thing to jump in on and for for those of you that aren't in the states um extension is as far as i can tell a uniquely american thing where we have our land grant institutions which are you know public institutions um that have a mission to um do exactly what you said to take take all that information in the ivory tower and translate it to an understandable form initially for use by farmers as extension has expanded into, you know, the expanding urban populations and to gardening and tree care and everything else. Um, but the, the problem is, is that there aren't necessarily the disciplinary experts in each state that has, um, that has the extension service. And so you end up getting publications from extension that are completely at odds with each other. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it's really frustrating because what I really want to do is promote extension materials, but but I can't because there's just too many things out there that aren't that aren't science based. Mm -hmm. And this kind of started because when when they were first doing extension, just providing information, um, it wasn't going through peer review. So in other words, you, you could write anything you wanted and you could give it to your extension service and they'd post it. And it was then, you know, at terms of the state was considered to be gospel. And it's, it's not. And so our institution and some others have instituted peer review. And so whenever I write a fact sheet or an extension manual, it has to go through peer review, which is just like any other peer review. There's at least at least three anonymous reviewers and yeah, it has yeah. to be a discussion with them and the editor to get things out. So, I mean, you can you can you can kind of see the best stuff through extension by looking at things again that are current, you know, within the last five years. And if there's some place on it where it says it's peer reviewed it's probably good information. I've seen exceptions to that, but that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, have you had any real surprises in your career? The things that turn out to be, perhaps if you've done some experimental work and something turn out to be really counterintuitive or something happened that you really didn't expect? Um, yeah, um, well, I didn't expect the mulch to be as, as beneficial as it was. I hate to go back to that, but the first work that we did was, was just um, some plots that had been overtaken by, by blackberries and a lot of other invasive things. And we, um, we, mowed, we mowed the plots and half of them we sprayed with Roundup to, you know, to kill everything. And the other half we put down, um, oh, about, about 20, 20, maybe 30 centimeters of, of wood chip mulch. So you know, around, around eight inches to a foot is what we put down. And, um, and then let that sit for a little bit. And then we planted you know, trees there. And then we, then we just watched. It was a restoration experiment to see which ones would do best. Well, we only had three, three replicates. And so it was a pretty small scale thing, but <laughs> basically everything in the, in the Roundup group died, not from the Roundup, but because soil conditions were so hostile and we had over 100% survival in the mulch plots. And the reason that worked is because so many of the snowberries that we had there started setting, setting seed and reproducing. So we had more plants than we started with. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was stunning. I had no idea that that one single thing, one thing would make that difference. And it's really changed the way that many people have planted now is to prepare the soil by, by you know, getting 
getting things basically mowed to the ground and then letting the, the wood chip mulch sit on top and letting this, the soil regenerate itself before planting. Mm -hmm. So that, that's been an overriding thing. But there's another thing that came out that I hated because it's, it's my bias that whenever I see anything that is prefaced by the by bio or eco, I tend to be really skeptical of it. So biochar, yeah, yeah. biochar came out oh, and, yes. you know, many, many years ago when I was reading about that and I thought, you know, here's another, you know, another huckster product, mm -hmm. but I decided to wait and let, let some science get published. And I came back mm -hmm. to the question, you know, three or four years later, and there was a ton of research and all the things that biochar can do in terms of binding, um, toxic chemicals in terms of providing literally uh, little houses for the microbes to live in. I mean, it was, and I haven't done any research on it myself. This was just by going through the literature and uh, again, translating it. Um, that it really was pretty amazing what you can do. It doesn't lend itself very well to gardens and landscapes, unfortunately, because it just doesn't. But if you had container plants or if you had a green roof or something where you had a, a, a reduced soil system, it really can make a huge difference in how well that system works. Oh, that's so. interesting. That, that, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, so it, it's actually quite small scale then, and there's not, yeah, there's, I know some of the advocates of it are sort of, you know, want to basically biochar the world. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's much better to just put the, the, the material on top of soil and let it incorporate naturally. Yes, <laughs> in <yes>. <laughs> Um, and in terms of what's going on in the plant sciences at the moment, um, is there anything that uh, is a, that perhaps is going to be hot in a few years' time? Any particular research that might have particular importance to smaller scale gardeners in a in a few years' time? Um, you know what I think is is coming out with more information and underscoring the importance of of doing this is looking at nutrient issues in soil. So we know all about nutrient deficiencies and that all goes back of course to crop production, which isn't necessarily very relevant to, to what we do as gardeners. But what we didn't have a lot of information on until more recently is nutrient toxicities. Mm -hmm. So gardeners unfortunately um, have a predisposition to adding too much stuff um, because they're looking at what happens in, in crop production. And the fact that you always have to, you know, add a balanced fertilizer, you know, NPK to get the nutrients back up when you're harvesting a crop and removing all that material. Yeah, yeah. Well, then you get a buildup of the soil if you're doing this in a garden where you're not removing everything, mm -hmm. especially a phosphate. And phosphate, phosphate toxicity is a real problem on a bunch of different levels. So that's becoming, that type of information is becoming more prevalent. Um, in fact, I just read a new article today that was talking about uh, iron deficiency. In, in leaves, and we've known for quite a, quite a long time that phosphate, high levels of phosphate can cause that. Turns out high levels of zinc do the same thing. So we're finding more of these relationships with, with research that show, you know, that if you have a soil test and you can look and see what your nutrient levels are, you can start figuring out not only what you need to add, but where you've got problems that you need to address. And so the soil test is the most single most valuable thing a gardener can have before they add anything, whether it's compost, fertilizer, anything, they, they have that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, interesting. Yeah, particularly about the phosphates. I mean, phosphorus is, has been argued that phosphorus is the element that is perhaps, uh, in terms of diminishing resources, the most the fundamental one. There's actually very few places in the world where you can go and dig a big hole and dig out loads of phosphates. Um, right. And it moves so slowly in the soil and it has been so massively overused in the, in, in the past. There's gonna come a point at which we run out of the stuff. Yeah. yeah. Although I do, I have a colleague who's, um, um, who's uh, works on um, dairy cattle and they've been making, you've probably heard of struvite before, but you know, it's a, it's a way of taking, um, especially cow manure, and then extracting the nutrients back and then being able to use that and apparently is a pretty yeah, good source yeah. of phosphorus too. So yeah, I, I the, the whole thing is so ironic that we're running out of phosphorus and yet gardeners just tend to, to use transplant fertilizers or balanced fertilizers without knowing what phosphate levels they already have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course the fact that, uh, yeah, my particular field of ecological planting, that uh, you know, one essential lesson is the vast majority of ornamental plants do not use and cannot even utilize the nutrients that all those 
packets and bottles down at the garden center tell you they they need uh you know and actually see plants growing in nature on you know what part what would hardly pass for soil in a garden and flourishing um yeah yeah and 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 again when you talk about the new research coming out you know doing use looking at labeled nitrogen and, and other labeled um compounds they've found for instance in trees that trees recycle about 90 percent of their own nitrogen they don't yeah, need yeah. to have mm -hmm. nitrogen added and so Sorry, on that subject, actually, we do have a question about does woody, fresh woody mulch rob soil of nitrogen? It does not. So that's one of those, those myths that's out there that people see two things happening and then they, they make an assumption. But the problem is, is that if you use the, the fresh wood chips as a, a container mix or, or in any way incorporate it into the soil or plant into it, yes. You're not your plants are going to be chlorotic and unhappy because there's it's a very high carbon nitrogen ratio. But we've we've done research and, and published as of other people that have looked at you know having the wood chips and then the soil interface and then below the soil and right at the soil interface, it's very low nitrogen. Yeah. But a centimeter below that, it's normal. Yes. So it does not affect the great majority of the, the soil volume where the roots are actually going to be found. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Great. Um, I know there's one question, but it wasn't on my list, so it may be unfair to pitch at you, but one that does, I mean, there's, there's a lot of hysteria about Roundup, um, and it's something you see, you know, like any, it's like a really useful drug, like Prozac or something. It, it works, and therefore it just gets massively overprescribed, and you then get the reaction. Um, and it, it's, it's particularly difficult one because of a whole range of, of reasons that it's become controversial. Um, and we'll, we'll, but you know, if you are faced with a landscaper or a garden designer who, or a home gardener who has an awful lot of perniciously weedy ground to clear, you know, Roundup does do an incredibly good job. Um, what, what's your, what's, what would you say about the current state of what we know about Roundup? It's really the same that we knew years before. There's just a lot more evidence behind it, which is that Roundup is one of the safest herbicides we've got because it targets a biochemical pathway yeah. that plants have that animals don't. Yes. And so glyphosate itself cannot do anything biochemically. Now, of course, whatever is in there with it, you know, whatever, you know, proprietary materials are there, I don't know because they're proprietary, but, but looking just specifically at the active ingredient, um, it doesn't do all these things that it's, it's accused of. And I, and this goes back to the whole thing with causation and correlation. Um, there have been some, ethically challenged researchers who published garbage science that have just conflated correlation to causation. There's one of them who's, who's based at MIT, who's, who's, who's the worst for this. She's a computer scientist and all she does is, is um, dump a lot of data into the computers and look at correlations. And then she blames everything, every human ill you can think of is blamed on increased use of glyphosate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's so, it's so unprofessional, it's dangerous, it's, yes, yes. Modern, it's really bad news. And so I spent a lot of time trying to get people to, to kind of back up, look at the quality of the research that's come out because she publishes in, you know, in, in mostly predatory journals. Yes. Um, her, she had no background in, in plants or soils or epidemiology or anything mm. that has anything to do with biology. Yes. She has a PhD in computer science. She's not an expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's uh, they, people like that who are, you know, when that is combined with missionary zeal um, and uh, good at social media can be can be incredibly dangerous. And I, I suspect a lot, you know, I think a lot of our European uh, debate about Roundup ha has been fired up by, by people like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, then the problem is, then you get these uh, legal judgments Mm -hmm. that, that find fault and that's used as evidence that, that, that there's a problem. And as I've told people, you know, winning a legal case has nothing to do with science. It depends on who's got the best legal team. Yes. Science yeah. doesn't make any difference at that level. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, I never promote using any herbicide before you do other things. And so, you know, my yeah. method of, of mowing and mulching, which mm -hmm. is, it's, it, it has no application of any chemicals, except obviously the chemicals that are in the mulch, you get rid of 90% of your weeds that way. Anything yeah. that's you know, an aggressive perennial, like blackberry or something, when it starts to come back in, I cut it off at the, at the, at the crown and I 
I dab on Roundup right onto the cut surface. Mm-hmm. And that's how I use Roundup. So, yeah. I mean, I use it, and I'm very sad that apparently um, in 2025, it will not be available to homeowners anymore. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, yeah, no, it's um, no driven away. I, ideology trumps trump science, as with the uh, yeah. uh, saying about vaccination. Right, well, uh, Wendy, you are wonderful. You are a breath of fresh air. I cannot wait to take your course. <laughs> Linda, can I ask you uh, about taxonomy? Um, as, 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 or, 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 you know, your views on tax, taxonomy. As we're just being told that rosemary is no longer rosemary, but is a salvia. Um, mm. So, you know, what, what are you, you know, any, any kind of views on that whole um, ball game? <laughs> address that even though I'm not a taxonomist and and the, the worst thing about being a horticulturist is for when someone finds out the immediate question is what's this plant yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, and, well, sometimes I do but I oftentimes don't so taxonomy was originally based on looking at morphological differences as we all know and then we we're looking at family groupings and then genus groupings based on mostly floral taxonomy then molecular genetics came along. And so now we can actually look at DNA and now we can look, we have what's called molecular taxonomy. And we found all of a sudden that things that apparently were closely related because they had similar flowers aren't related at all. In some cases, they're in completely different families. And so that's what drives gardeners nuts is that they have to then learn new names. Um, and this is, this actually hits home for me because the, the last book that um, I published with uh, the late Art Krukeberg is on gardening with native plants in the Pacific Northwest, which has about a thousand plants in it. And I had to go through every single one and, and change many of them to the newest taxonomy. And then of course you have to refer back to the old ones so the gardeners can still find it. And boy, that took, that took months to do. And it's already out of date because it keeps on changing. So it, this goes back to the whole thing about science changes. And now we've got this new, this new methodology for truly looking at relatedness. And it is very frustrating to people that have that have dutifully memorized their scientific yes. names. Well, hopefully the, because now they, the, 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 it, it, once you're based on DNA, DNA analysis, you can much more finally solve a lot of these questions. Yeah. My complaint is the completely unspellable, unmemorable names that some botanists come up with. I mean, Asta was clearly an unwieldy genus. Uh, so, what do they do? Create Symphira trichum, which I still cannot spell. <laughs> um, I mean, oh, it, it, that, 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 is, that, is, that is maddening. Mm-hmm. It's difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. I mean, I suppose the other thing, just sort of thinking about myth busting, is that, uh, you know, the horticult, the, the people who produce horticultural products and gardening products, I mean, gardeners, amateur gardeners, gardeners alike, they're the first people to put their hands up and say, it's my fault this hasn't worked. I, I must be at fault, you know, and 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 it's at their best interest to to make gardeners feel like, yeah, you're you're the one who's who's got it wrong. So here's another product that will do, you know. So so we are sort of, I think, you know, we are victims really of of that. I think the first thing is is teaching people that the rudiments that you know they need to know so that they have that confidence not to feel like it's failed, it must be me. Wow. I've I've used the wrong thing, too much of a thing, or the thing that was here last week and coming, you know. So I think it's it's about kind of you know giving it's like children giving them a confidence in what they in what they're doing is going to help enormously because then you know, they will have more confidence to go forward rather than think, yeah, it's all my fault. This is, you know, this has failed. Well, that's, and that's exactly right. And, and one of the things that, that I think drives people crazy is pruning because, you know, there's supposedly all these rules for pruning different kinds of plants. And, and basically, you know, a woody plant is a woody plant and there really aren't special rules for any special plant. There are some really simple almost foolproof physiological rules we can use having having to do with the age of the plant but you know it's growth space all that stuff and that and then you don't have to worry about if it's a rose or something else you don't have to worry yeah yeah and we hope to be having annie we hope to have a pruning course organized fairly soon don't we We do we do yes and and i think also it's 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 about asking students to look before because i've observed students at a pruning um uh, you know, pruning and propagation lecture where they want to be told 
before they look to find the answers themselves. So not looking at a plant and seeing where is the new growth coming from? Where can I cut this? It's like, oh, I just need to be told. Can I and not even looking up, but I just need to be told so I can write this down instead of observation of, well, stand back and look at that plant and see where is the new growth? Is there any new growth? When did it flower? You know, and all of those things, which if you work through, um, but it's it's the same thing again, isn't it? It's taking a step back and giving people um, uh, well, giving people the, the the confidence to make those uh, decisions for themselves instead of just saying, you know, write down 450 different shrubs and when you prune them. You know, it's a, exactly. Well, yeah. you know what? I think I think it gets back to something that I've been complaining about for close to 20 years is that, you know, decades ago there were all kinds of organismal physiologists, you know, people that studied the organism. Um, and now because of the advent of all these great molecular techniques, um, what used to be this nice field of organismal physiology is, is split out. You've got people that do stuff on the landscape level that are ecologists, and you've got people that do stuff on the cellular molecular genetic level, and no one's looking at the whole plant anymore. And when you're not looking at the whole plant, you lose the physiology, you lose the ability to, to, to read the plant, and figure out in terms of the environment what's going on and that's been lost yeah, um, yeah they don't have they don't teach these classes at universities anymore they don't have faculty that do what i do um in in academia anymore i mean i don't teach college classes anymore because i work with um extension audiences but there's no one that teaches whole plant physiology mm. it's all molecular and genetic and we're losing out our under our ability to understand what plants do yeah yeah yeah, yeah. right yeah, uh, so perhaps on that note. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, on that note, we can, we, can, we can say we're looking forward to your course on yes, which is gonna, <laughs> yeah, And that whole thing, I'm really interesting to use that expression of read the plant is one of the things that I yeah. was in my, my workshops I do. It's about, it's about getting on your hands and knees and, and reading the plant and giving people mm -hmm. the tools mm -hmm. to, to make their own, own decisions and predictions and assessments. Brilliant. That was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Linda. Um, oh, certainly. It was fun. Thank you, Linda. I look forward to running this, uh, this, this webinar course with you. And, um, well, uh, hopefully meet up again sometime. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Good. And thanks, everybody, for joining in. And, um, yeah, join us again. when uh, every, every Thursday we have, um, you know, a, a different person every and week. We're in, the state, we're in the States again next week, aren't we, Annie? We are, indeed. On yes, the, on yeah. the coast, back in, back in Pennsylvania. <laughs> yes yeah yeah okay thanks Great. very much thank everyone you. stay safe everyone and thank you linda that's been fantastic yeah, thank you very much it was fun have a wonderful day cheerio bye, bye. bye. thanks linda <laughs> you're welcome <laughs>